Thanks, Mary. Uh, reminds me of a mentor of mine in the civil rights movement when you mentioned King, uh, Dorothy Cotton, who says when she speaks to groups of students, she says she worked very closely with Martin Luther King, and they look at her and say, and you're still alive. <laughs> yeah, we're still alive. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to say in a minute why I think this is extraordinarily important as a discussion. Uh, it's really good to be in a conference that John DeGraff has, has helped to craft around his life work, uh, the meaning of wealth, a uh, richer understanding of wealth, what we called in a piece many years ago the Commonwealth. Um, I get all sorts of indirect um, benefits from knowing John, in including uh, when Mari Strom, who's my wife, a South African democracy educator. I was delighted she could be here in the country and come with us, drive down with me from the Twin Cities. We gave uh, one of John's books to um, our nephew in South Africa, um, Sammy Sapphire, Affluenza. He was reading it, and he called up Mari with great excitement and says, do you know your name is in a book? <laughs> and I said, yeah, actually, it's a friend of mine who wrote the book. But it's a pleasure to be here with John, and I think this topic is important. I think on the Commonwealth theme, um, the point of looking at the meaning of wealth has several extraordinarily important dimensions in our time. One is, as I'll describe, there is a profound discontent and unease among the American people about the values directions of the country, where we're headed as a society. This surfaces a conversation, it has potential to surface a conversation that is extraordinarily important and urgently needed. Secondly, <clears throat> this theme, understood richly, brings us back to a founding vision of American democracy that we have largely neglected in recent decades, and that is the idea that America is a society that produces both public wealth and private wealth. This was symbolized by the term commonwealth. John Adams, uh, one of the founders, urged that every state be called a commonwealth and four were designated commonwealths, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and um, Virginia. Um, but more deeply, the commonwealth had resonance because ordinary people out of the traditions that they brought with us to the United States and before the United States to America, and then the native traditions which were here, saw the meaning of communities as anchored in and symbolized by common wealths or commons, from the village green to the meeting hall to the um, community center to the roads and bridges and dams and forests and irrigation ditches ancient traditions as old as human history um, of collective labors, communal labors, in which people across different backgrounds worked together to take care of the things that they needed in common, um, came to life in American political lexicon, in the term and the language of commonwealth, which remained a vital concept through the 1930s and really through the 40s. In fact, one of... Uh, the things John has taught me was a story of Terry Pettis in um, Washington and Seattle, uh, old radical from the Washington Commonwealth Federation, whose work in the 1960s saving a houseboat community on Lake Union in Seattle by f framing the issue as the reinvigoration of the Commonwealth, which was threatened by the forces of purported progress, birthed basically the environmental mo movement in the United States. The Commonwealth retrieval in that case was uh, uh, an enormous importance. But I think that's actually the threshold that we're on today. And this is the third reason this topic is so important, that returning to a balanced understanding of wealth, or private and public wealth, or commonwealth, is also the way, as we work it through, and this cannot be simply an abstract discussion, but as we work it through as a people, as we debate it, as we discuss it, as we integrate those themes into our lives, it is the way to heal the huge divisions that we've seen open up. So what I want to do is talk about three things. 
Um, I want to talk about the problem without a name to do a riff on Betty Friedan's feminine mystique, the hidden discontents that Americans feel. And despite the seeming polarizations and fragmentations and silo cultures and um, red and blue America, the fact that we actually have a lot of similarity about core value discontents, the core views of what's going wrong in America. So this project on understanding and defining America's wealth speaks to that, holds the potential to break a silence that is pervasive. Secondly, I want to make a case about the obstacles that we face, because I think if we don't name clearly in um, tough-minded ways the challenges to this conversation having any depth, um, I think we're just blowing steam. Um, I think there are enormous potentials, and I think there are very daunting obstacles. Um, in fact, uh, a cautionary tale is the last uh, a commission that I helped uh, get started out of the 1990s. We worked with the Clinton administration in something called the Reinventing Citizen Citizenship Project. Our mantra, by the way, was if you only focus on reinventing government, improving government performance without simultaneously a broad process of reinventing citizenship, of pervasive identity and practices, then we're going to get a lot of angry shoppers. So since the Tea Party in some ways embodies the image of the angry shopper, I feel uh, we were all too prescient um, inadvertently. But the, but the challenge of the reinventing citizenship took shape in something called the National Commission on Civic Renewal that we proposed to the White House and then was taken up by the Pew Charitable Trusts, co-chaired by uh, Sam Nunn of Georgia and uh, Bennett, the former Reagan uh, Education Secretary. And we had a very distinguished group of across partisan leaders who were concerned about the state of citizenship, published an important report, used the public work concept centrally that I'll describe later. Uh, the problem was it didn't really make much of a difference. So I think the danger of this initiative is promising as important, as vital as it is in terms of what it speaks to in America is that it'll be another commission. And commissions easily disappear into uh, 24 seven news cycle, which with little meaning. Thirdly, I want to argue that for this to be real will mean what we call cultural organizing, a great tradition that's not really well thought about today or well known, but there are some important historical precedents. I'll give a couple of examples of cultural organizing, including our great colleague Bill Doherty, who works on values, changes tied to organizing approaches, and has shown the power of an approach which has people think about the values of balanced lives and community wealth and community sustainability in the context of doing work together across lines of division. And then if I have time, by the way, how long do I have? When are we going to start, Peter? Uh, what, what, what's our schedule? I need, to, I need to actually have a monitor on my time because I can get carried away. Okay. So maybe somebody could raise their hand when I have until 9.30. Is it really till 9.30? Do I have 15 minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I may not have my second... Uh, instance in the end, except to mention that we're working with state colleges across the country, and we think students can play a very important role in the value changes and also the taming the political dysfunctions which are threatening to create a country spiraling out of control uh, in this election cycle, but it's long developing. So first, on the hidden discontents, uh, many of you may remember Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. She begins that book in 1963 with a description of women in suburbs purportedly in consumer utopia. Nixon had just had a debate with Nikita Khrushchev in Russia, the famous kitchen debate in 1959. Nixon was a vice president. Khrushchev was the head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Uh, Nixon had said, America will triumph because what democracy gives us is the ability to buy all these kind of appliances. 
to show the problems, the cross-national, cross-ideological problems in the contemporary world, you know what uh, Nikita Khrushchev's reply was? No, we'll bury you in consumer products. We're going to outdo you. We're going to produce far more than you do. Communism is much more successful at producing consumer goods. Well, so when Betty Friedan spoke to the hidden discontents that women felt in the suburbs, she was speaking to um, the feeling that women were crazy. They were supposed to be happy. This was uh, a world of modern appliances, of consumer pleasures. And she named the discontents by saying that women experience a problem without a name. That was really the birth of the women's movement. But in fact, if you look carefully at her text, it wasn't really men that were simply the problem. I mean, it, that was a pretty easy target in some ways. But it was more generally a whole culture that was dysfunctional. And I would say that all the evidence is we've become more dysfunctional. And there's a lot of evidence, both in our own work. We work with communities across Minnesota and other parts of the country, and then other studies. For example, the Merck Family Foundation did a study uh, that, organized by Richard Harwood in 1995 called Yearning for Balance about Americans' feelings about values. You know what they found? 85% of Americans feel our values are out of whack. We're too selfish, consumerist, materialist, hyper-competitive as a society. I mean, deep discontents across party lines, cultural lines, demographics. 95% of African Americans thought that. Over 80% of conservative suburban Republicans thought the same thing. And then the other finding in the Merck family study is that 89% of people talked to felt they were basically the only ones who thought that. So there's a profound sense of unease about American values, where we're going as a society, and the sense that people feel that by themselves in isolation. I mean, I could give you many examples, and perhaps today um, I will tell you more from our experience, but just a couple of examples. Uh, Susan Wiley, who's a colleague in early family childhood education who does classes with young parents across Minnesota, said that about every class she teaches of young parents, at some point, some parent will say, I feel like I'm going crazy. I'm fighting the television. I'm fighting the advertising messages. I'm fighting the notion of infantilized appetites. I'm fighting my neighbors, I'm fighting my friends, I'm shutting off the TV, and finally I give up. So Wiley describes a pattern of pervasive discontent and a sense of silence and the sense of um, hopelessness that I would say is widespread. I was down in Houston last week. This is a cross-partisan issue I want to stress again. I was speaking at a community college, Lone Star Community College, Kingwood campus outside of Houston in a working class suburb, pretty culturally, racially diverse in the last few years. It's become much more so. But 61% of the students voted for John McCain. This was not a liberal hotbed. But I talked about the dysfunctions of American democracy, the need for a we the people uh, politics across party lines, remembering that the preamble to the Constitution says we, the people, establish government to do our work as our instrument of our work. It doesn't say government is the enemy, and it doesn't say government is a solution. It's different than contemporary conservatism and contemporary liberalism. Um, and I said that the two problems that we face in realizing that politics, although there are a lot of structural, institutional, social reasons that they exist, have to do with things we've internalized in ourselves. One is the waiting for Superman phenomenon. We've come to look to experts to fix things. And I told the story of the Obama town hall a couple of weeks ago where he was interacting with a, his own voter base. And the first woman got up and said, Mr. President, I'm tired of defending you. I voted for a man who would make change, and it hasn't happened yet. And a young student got up after that she and said, I thought you were going to bring us the American dream, and it feels like it's slipping away. 
And I thought, oh my God, there's something wrong with this picture. There's an elephant in the room. So I told the students this. I said, what's, in, what's the problem? And they said, well, I don't know. It's kind of, it is fu something funny. And then we talked about how that is not Obama's message in 2008. There were a lot of candidates who said, uh, uh, vote for me and I'll bring you these voter packages. In fact, Hillary Clinton had herself as Santa Claus in December 19, in 2007, giving out checks to different interest groups. That's because her, her consultant, Mark Penn, believes that people should be conceived as consumers. That's his whole shtick. It's basically a lot of liberal democratic politics. But Obama's message was not that. In fact, he challenged that appetite, and remember, around the oil tax and so forth. But even more deeply, he said, I can do very little to solve the country's problems by myself. The message of this, can is, mes message of this campaign is, yes, we can. The top of the website said, I'm not asking you to believe in my ability to make change. I'm asking you to believe in your ability. We'll need all hands on deck for every significant change we want. The field operation integrated what, we'll, what I'll describe as organizing elements, which are very different than mobilizing elements. Organizing means that people are intelligent enough to figure out in their own communities how to do things. And they were a uh, vast level of, of education in the Obama campaign around things like public narrative, one-on-one -on -one -on -one interviews, and basic organizing skills to equip campaign people to be involved in making change. So when uh, people said to the president, we wanted to elect you to make change for us, and Obama dutifully tried to recount all the things he had done, and Dan Blatz in the Washington Post said he just didn't have a no long enough list. He should have said more things. That's a profound dysfunction in our culture. It's a waiting for Superman culture tied to a consumer culture. So we look for getting things from government, and we imagine that somebody is going to deliver them, and we've lost our own sense of agency. That's the really deepest problem of a, of a culture which is where people feel are out of control, even if they don't like the fact. Now, the second huge problem and challenge and topic is that we have developed ways of, as a society of tapping and activating anger but they're highly scripted and channelized and divide us. They don't illuminate common ground. And I could describe this at great length, but let me just mention briefly the core of this is called mobilizing. Mobilizing technologies, which are scripted, um, highly developed, and have spread across the landscape. So when we uh, lament or decry or despair the polarization and the sound bites in today's political culture in this election, and it's pretty bad. I mean, anybody wants to see a, a hilarious column on it, Gail Collins yesterday called The Fury Failure has case after case of wildly inflamed um, campaign positions, left and right, that just make no sense at all. Free-floating rage. She said, actually, this kind of free-floating makes sense to to uh, be angry if you have a flat tire or your spouse is unfaithful. Free floating rage never gets you anything except broken windows and upturned garbage cans, but that's where we've come to. But the fact is that that has been long developing and it's significantly scripted. In fact, I would say that if we tie deep concerns about where the country is going to the scripts and the mechanisms for activating people, then what we have is a formula for increasing polarity and dysfunction. And mobilizing was well-intentioned in its 1970s incarnation, which built on a whole century of what's called mass politics, or imagining people as consumers and asking for better deals for the poor and the dispossessed. Uh, but mobilizing took shape in the 1970s, especially in mechanisms like the door-to-door -door canvas, which were ways to try to activate large numbers of people to press for environmental changes and also to resist pressures, which were, seek were threatening to roll back the environmental consumer protection gains of the of the 60s, affirmative action, progressive taxation. Uh, mobilizing began with a particular method, which is door-to-door -door canvas, which is now embodied in all of the larger environmental groups except for the National Wildlife Federation, uh, the Nader Network, consumer groups, PERGs, uh, the basic method of progressive action on a large scale has become canvassing and then allied mechanisms like moveon.com. 
Um, and then more recently, talk radio, cable news. The problem with mobilizing is that in pursuit of activating large numbers of people, it dumbs down radically political discussion and creates polarities. So the mobilizing formula at the heart of the canvas is first of all, you have an enemy, a target. Secondly, you define issues as good versus bad. This ironically was in Saul Alinsky's last book, who's seen as the founder of community organizing, but as I'll mention, organizing is a very different tradition. By the end of his life, he wasn't in talking about organizing. He was talking about mobilizing the haves and the have-nots, have-sums and have-nots against the haves. And to do that, you use mobilizing techniques that create a good versus evil frame. Thirdly, you have a simplified script, a door-to-door -door canvasser with Perg who goes door-to-door, -door, and if somebody asks a complicating question about the target, a lot of the script is how to get them back to who they're supposed to be mad at. And fourth, convey the sense that people are being victimized and we're here to save you. So those are the four ingredients of a mobilizing formula. And as one can see with a little bit of Reflection, that is spread across the political spectrum. In fact, it's arguably what Karl Rove picked up to deal with the whole world in terms of the axis of evil. And it litters the campaign and civic culture today. It is what we hear from talk radio, or what we hear see on CSNBC, or Fox News, NSNBC. I mean, I would say it is the, or the movies of Michael Moore, as skillful as they have done, he got his schooling in, Ralph Nader's shop, and he uses he always uses that formula. Analyze any movie, and you can see that formula at work. So we have a deep problem. And let me say on the topic of wealth, there's a specific um, consequence. I would say that if you put a mobilizing approach together with the fact we've become increasingly an expert in consumer culture, we've seen a, it means we've seen a lot of erosion of the places where people used to interact across lines of difference. The store and the community or the settlement house that was a meeting ground or the um, neighborhood school or the trade union that had storefront offices. Um, Hubert Humphrey said he got all of his politics from his father's drugstore in a little town in South Dakota where his father was one of six Democrats in a town of 600 Republicans, and he made his drugstore into the civic center of that town. His life work was to create a civic center in Dolan, South Dakota. And it was the launching pad for all sorts of community projects. And we've seen an erosion of those spaces that we've become a more and more expert culture delivering services to people conceived as consumers and clients. It's a huge civic erosion in the very fabric of the society. And one of the consequences is even the words at the heart of the Commonwealth tradition, I, I look forward, Ben, to talking about this earlier. I, don't, I think I would argue that actually the heart of the American dream was, I don't know exactly what, how you frame the escape from work, but I would argue that the heart of the American dream was the idea that work has both public and private meanings, that communities build the Commonwealth. They build things together. They build schools and libraries and community centers and religious congregations and town squares and infrastructure and bridges and take care of forests. Um, and that that was actually what made Americans feel that the Commonwealth was, was ours, government of the people. It wasn't something out there. It wasn't something handed down. It's what made the idea of a public world alive, people's sense of connection through their own labors. Um, and the irony is that the meaning of work has changed radically in the last 50 years in ways that have eroded the public side of work almost entirely. And you can see this in, in the contrasts between two sets of depictions of the New Deal, the Great Depression, and the popular movements of the Great Depression. So the first is from the 1997 Roosevelt Memorial in Washington. This is the breadline, one of two sets of, of Siegel statues of ordinary people. The message of the Roosevelt Memorial is beautiful. A, a, construction as it is, but the message of the memorial, and especially of these two statues, the other is called Rural Couple, is that people were pitiable, helpless, victimized, and Roosevelt and the New Deal saved the people. I mean, you can see it in their faces. The despair, the vacancy, the apathy. 
Um, I would say that's a, that's a view of contemporary liberalism. Uh, the poor, the dispossessed, the um, oppressed as victimized and needing champions, needing advocates, needing people to deliver the goods. And I would say, would say that we've had much too much of our professional practice founded on that principle today. We're delivering things to the poor, seeing people in terms of needs, deficiencies, and also seeing people increasingly as consumers. That's actually the same as Mark Penn's formula for liberalism. The irony of this, the very day that I saw this in 1997, I went to the National Archives exhibit on New Deal public work art. What were the artistic depictions of that very period? And you know what they look like? Completely different message. It wasn't romantic. It didn't deny the suffering and the hardship and the hunger and the unemployment and the Dust Bowl. There were all sorts of depictions of that in photojournalism and murals and Harlem Renaissance art and music and jazz and blues. But the overwhelming message of the New Deal art, which, by the way, you can see on the web. It's a beautiful exhibit, and it talks about the kind of uh, recovery of a sense of common people as uh, agents of change and, and civic energy. This was the message. It's not, uh, it's not too clear, but this is, a, this is a mural in Kansas of the National Youth Administration, youth public work, jobs. The, the center stage is this quote from Roosevelt, we can ill afford to lose the skills and intelligence of these young men and women. Every New Deal jobs program, unlike the contemporary stimulus package jobs, every public project, every public project was described in terms of tapping the talent and the energy of people who didn't want to be on relief to build the nation, to build the Commonwealth. A very dramatic example of that were the CCC camps. We did all sorts of interviews with people who were young men in the Civilian Conservation Corps, which built the parks and the irrigation systems and contour farming and forests. Every single person said, we didn't really necessarily begin this way, but our supervisors told us the value of the work we were doing to the nation. We were building the Commonwealth. We were producing America. It prepared us for the Second World War. This is, this, this is the real hidden secret of the greatest generation, by the way. People fought the war, but they were prepared in the public work projects of the 1930s, both in government and outside of government, the collective labors of the people in responding to hardship. And in that contrast is what we've lost. And the irony is that now the theme of work is picked up by those who would dis dismantle government. I mean, this is a tremendous irony. Um, I think it's a great mistake by progressives which, who commonly say the conservatives or the Tea Party simply wants to get rich quick. They want to make a lot of money. The most serious intellectual theorist of the conservative movement is Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. And I would really encourage people to look at his recent book called The Battle how the fight between free enterprise and big government will shape America's future. His basic argument is that progressives have no interest in nor concern for nor value of work. And he's not defining work in terms of making a lot of money. In fact, he explicitly eschews that notion. He says there are two visions. There's a struggle between two visions of the country's future. And one, America will continue to be a nation organized around limited government, and the idea of rewards determined by people's efforts. He says that some people will make money out of that, but that's not really the point. He argues that this is not about getting rich, but about what he calls the pursuit of happiness through earned success. Earned success is a creation of value in our lives and in the lives of others which, um, through which we get pleasure. It's the stuff of entrepreneurs who seek value through innovation, hard work, and passion. It's what parents feel when their children do wonderful things, when social innovators change lives, when artists create something of beauty. He says the contrast to this is a vision of government delivering consumer services to the citizenry. 
and expanded benefits and entitlements. Now, that's profoundly ironic because at the heart of democratic change movements, including the movement which shaped me, the freedom movement, was the idea of the dignity and the value to the, contra of, to the commonwealth of everyday labors. I mean, remember those great scenes from the freedom movement like women in Montgomery walking um, in their boycott of buses or the final moment of Martin Luther King's career, the Memphis garbage strike, and those thousands of signs that say, I am a man of garbage workers, saying we're contributing to the society. We're making public contributions and using the claim of that labor to make claims on the society for full inclusion and, and a greater sense of justice and, and democracy. So when we lose that core connection between work of worth, contribution, and public meaning, um, and progressive change, we're in a formula for disaster, and it's e we're easily prey to, to scripts that divide us rather than finding common ground. So let me just conclude with several examples of what I think can be done that I call cultural organizing. Now, cultural organizing is a complement to on-the-ground organizing. And I must say that the whole idea of organizing, either cultural or community organizing, broad-based organizing, is a different framework than we typically think with in academics, in professions, in um, information systems, where we think about change as doing a report, making a study, releasing it to the public. Maybe somebody will see it and take action. Even a lot of media is built around that. Cultural organizing says, who do we need to work with, and how can ideas live in the world with impact? And how can people own them and develop a sense of empowerment and agency as they work with them? So <clears throat> there's a connection. In a lot of ways, cultural organizing is what happened at the very founding of America with the Constitution, which was widely debated and hotly disputed and improved through time, through the ratification process, and therefore became the, the kind of iconic architecture of the American uh, democracy. But it's because people worked so I think the, the what is wealth challenge is how do we work this? How do we find the networks and the organizations and the places where people are working across lines of difference, learn from them and build on them to really talk about <coughs> what is wealth and what, is, what are our values and how do we create balance? And I would put it, how do we revive the sense of commonwealth in America? So one of our colleagues who's, who's uh, extraordinarily skilled in this uh, John knows well, is a, a family therapist named William Doherty. Let me commend him and his work and his colleagues' work. He directs now the Citizen Professional Center at the University of Minnesota. About 15 years ago now, Doherty came by. I, I knew he was a therapist. He's probably the world's most prominent family therapist. I mean, not a marginal figure in the field. Um, led the field through several different changes, systems theory and then a communitarian turn. And, um, Doherty came by and said, actually, we need another level of work to make what we're doing serious, to make it live in the world, to make change that we hope for. So he began to work with the concept that professionals are not delivering services and they're not the center of the universe. <laughs> that on the problems families face, whether it's consumer pressures, bullying, advertising, school, um, teen suicide, um, violence on television, uh, families without stable parents. Whatever the problems, professionals can only make marginal change. That the real energy and talent and solutions are to be found among families themselves. But it requires a radical change in professional mindset to catalyze that, to help bring it out, to convene it. So he began to develop what he called the model of citizen professionalism. And if you Google Citizen Professional Center, you'll find about 15 stories of very powerful partnerships. All of them, Doherty says, have to do with value change and culture change. But they're very different. In fact, he said one of the things we had to unlearn right away was the idea we were going to make much change by repu publishing reports about this. It wasn't going to change things. And even the groups that he was working with in middle class communities, like the Families Balance, um, Balance for Success and Putting Family First, 
quickly the message began to appeal to middle class communities that fell out of control of their lives they don't have any time for family dinners anymore they don't have any time for talking to their kids they're taking them to soccer games and ballet classes and preparing them for to try to get into an ivy league school the competitive hyper competitive pressures in suburbs of savage so when he started talking about this in suburban communities around minnesota people started acting like they were in a revival rally i mean they would break down and start crying and get up and start cheering now the first few groups that started organizing around this um, did reports they published studies how dysfunctional it is for kids never to have family time i mean there are all sorts of ironies so the best predictor of success in college completely counterintuitively given our culture the best predictor is whether you have meals with your families which of course is the first thing that goes when you're trying to prepare your kid for a hyper success um, but reports didn't do very much so what they found was they needed to develop some action some ways to raise and create tension and challenge and work with professionals and athletic systems and and clergy and school systems in communities in a much more organizing culture change identity change professional change kind of way too many too many stories to tell you but if you look at the the citizen professional center google that you'll find remarkable stories of change and they basically all have to do with the idea of leveling the field, creating a much more collaborative partnership if we want to make culture change. If we want to affect the larger cultural dynamics, we need to have professionals who don't see themselves at the center of the universe delivering services. We need to see professionals who learn to think of themselves as part of the citizens, working with other citizens, catalysts and organizers and conveners, using the authority they have, because in our world, professionals have immense authority using the authority in democratic ways, not in ways that displace other people's agency. I want to call attention to that work because it's pioneering. It is at the center of this if this is going to be a serious, significant, society-changing project. Looking at patterns of citizen professionalism will be critical. And then finally, just to end on a note, um, we think it's time for citizens to step up to the plate about values and about the basic uh, future of our democracy. And the electoral system itself um, is an occasion to do that. If we learn how to think beyond the partisan categories, I mean, it's not like you put aside partisanship, but recognize that there's more to America's future than partisan identities. Um, and here, I might note the, the case of South Africa, Mari works with an organization called Edasa, which was originally the Institute for a Democratic Alternative in South Africa, founded by the leader of the parliamentary opposition to the apartheid system in the, the great uh, uh, democratic alliance in the apartheid parliament, battling apartheid. Zeal Slabert quit parliament in 1986 because he said politicians cannot solve the problems of South Africa. We're headed for a train wreck. And we need a much broader citizen movement to put a check on, to gain control of, to reappropriate power over our destiny. And they did hundreds and hundreds of meetings at every level of the society, bringing together whites and blacks so that they could begin to plan for and work for a common future. We need something similar, but I want to argue that it actually, especially using these value themes, what does America stand for? What are our common values? Using the 2012 election cycle, um, is a way to challenge voters and challenge candidates, challenge ourselves and challenge the system to stop demonizing and polarizing and pandering and infantilizing and to say we are the authors of our own fate. That's going to take work and preparation. Our own network of, of uh, collaboration here is especially with uh, uh, state colleges and universities we have a strong partnership with the 230 state colleges in the American Democracy Project. We know students are ripe for this message and for preparation to challenge candidates. But just an example, I mean, I thought in that town meeting a couple of weeks ago, if two or three voters in the room had gotten up and said, excuse me, Mr. President, we didn't ask you for your list of what you've done, and turned to the other voters and said, 
Excuse us. This wasn't the message we voted for. Have we forgotten in two years that that was not Obama's message, that he was going to deliver change to us? He said we all have to be agents of change. We all have to be responsible. We all need to take a step out of our comfort zone and work across the lines of division and address our common problems. And by the way, of course, a good deal of this was a value discussion, too. Who are we as a people? Are we only about making money and hyper-competitive success? If two or three people in that town meeting had said that in that night, that would have been a discussion all across the nation the next morning. So we know in 2012, if we have discussions and voters prepared to challenge the demonizing, polarizing, infantilizing patterns in politics, say, we do not want to hear what you're going to fix for us. We want to know how you're going to partner with us. This is the work we're doing in Iowa City or Des Moines or Minneapolis or St. Paul or New York or Albuquerque or Flagstaff or Atlanta, Georgia. We want to know how government can be partners with us in this work. We don't want to know how you're going to save us. We don't think you're going to save us. And you're certainly not going to save our value system. That will create a moment of citizenship. That will create what I saw as a young man in the March on Washington, my dad had just gone on staff of SCLC. Uh, he'd been in the Red Cross. I laid out my sleeping bag on my father's hotel floor and heard King practice, I have a dream. And if you look at the text of that speech, while he says, we are fighting, there will never be quiet in America as long as we deny justice. He also said, those who want to drink from the cup of justice cannot um, simultaneously drink the cup of bitterness and hatred. The March on Washington program note said, in a neighborhood dispute there must be, there may be stunts and hot insults and rough words, but when a whole people speaks to its government, the quality of the action and the dialogue needs to reflect the worth of the people and the responsibility of the government. That was a call to think in bigger terms. And it was channeling the spirit and the energy and the dignity and the discipline that had inculcated, that had grown over years in communities across the South. This was not a speech that King, a, a vision of America that he simply thought up in the middle of the night. This was what he had seen in communities across the South that people had developed a sense of a larger self, a larger public possibility, an ability to engage in co amazingly constructive ways, even those filled with hatred, recognizing that through the philosophy of nonviolence and other means, that everybody is complicated, everybody has a story, and to live together in a place is to learn how to work with people who may be doing terrible things. So the promise of looking at the meaning of wealth is to call us to citizenship and the work of citizenship in a large sense, in a noble sense, at the same time in an everyday sense, to combine the everyday and the quotidian with the vision of the commonwealth which was a nation's beginning. So I'm delighted to be here. I think this is extraordinarily important. I look forward to thinking strategically today about how we might launch a real movement. Thank you.